In this video, we're going to develop a first order heat transfer equation for an enclosed space. Enclosed space might be, for example, your house or a greenhouse or a small enclosure that you're using to do test and experiment in lab. If you think of your house, in general, uh, you know, you want to keep your house at a nice warm temperature or comfortable temperature inside, but the temperature outside changes. It goes cold in the winter or hot in the, the summer. And heat either enters or escapes through the windows or through the walls or through the doors and, and so forth. And what we want to do is we want to develop a, a model, a simplified model for this house so that we can figure out what the dynamics of the house are. We can figure out how long does it take to warm up the house when we turn on our heater. We can figure out how much energy do we need in the dead of winter to keep the house at a reasonable temperature. We can figure out how long will it take for the house to cool off, for example, if we turn down the heat when we go to bed at night. We can do all this with some simplified equations, some approximations, but in general, even though the, the house is obviously a fairly complex structure with lots of different pieces to it, in general, this approach works pretty darn well for, 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 for designing houses, for designing heating systems for houses, for example. So let's say that we have a house and the house has windows and doors and, and roofs and walls. And I'm not going to draw all those because I don't want to clutter this up too much. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to draw a control volume around this house. And we're going to say that everything inside of this house is the same. Even though the walls are more massive than the air, we're going to lump everything together and say that inside the house, the temperature everywhere is the same. And we're going to say that, that because of this, there's a certain amount of energy inside the house, where energy is proportional to the temperature, and I'm going to put a little subscript here in for inside, times some heat capacitance. Now, again, the, the walls have more heat capacitance than the air, but if we add up the heat capacitance of the, of the walls and the temperature of the walls and add that to the heat capacitance of the air and the temperature of the air, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, again, we can lump all this together as um, into one energy term. Now how does energy get in and out of this, this control volume? Well, there's two ways. One is energy can come in through the boundary in the form of heat, and we'll call that QBND for heat. Q stands for heat traveling through the boundary. And the other way is that we can have, for example, a furnace on the inside of the house, and it generates a certain amount of heat, and we're going to call that QI for interior. So we have heat being generated inside the house by the heater, uh, by people, by pets, uh, when you're cooking, all that sort of thing. And we have heat that's coming in through the house uh, walls by convection or conduction. Convection meaning air leaking through the windows or conduction meaning heat coming through the walls. Radiation, if you've ever seen an infrared photograph of a house, you can see the different parts of the house have different uh, amounts of radiation that, that escape through the house. When we do this, we can write an energy balance for the, for, the, for the house, and we can say that the change in energy over time is equal to the heat that comes across the boundary plus the heat that is being generated internally. These are just energy flows, and the amount of energy that comes in per, per unit time is how much the energy in the, in the interior changes. But since we said that E equals some constant C times T in, we can write on the left-hand side, C times the derivative of T in over DT equals Q boundary plus Q interior. Now, Q interior is, is a, a known or a specified quantity. We have a furnace that has a given size. It puts out a certain amount of heat. We can read the nameplate and see what that is. We can, we can estimate how much heat people are giving off depending on if they're sitting watching television or working out on their stationary bicycle or something like this. The more difficult one is, is, is to figure out how the heat is flowing across the boundary. So let's look at a little section of wall that leads to the outside. Oops. And this wall has some insulation in it. And inside we have some temperature T in, and outside we have some temperature T out. Now you're all familiar with 
R factor for insulation. The, the, the higher the R factor, the more insulation ability foam will have in your wall, for example. And so we can say that, that this wall has some resistance R to heat transfer, and it's exactly analogous to resistance in electricity. In fact, when we're dealing with electricity, we have a voltage on one side, a resistor, or we can have a voltage on one side, a resistor, and a voltage on the other side. And if this resistor has, has a value R, then we know that the current, which we call I, is equal to the voltage difference between V1 and V2 divided by the resistance. So V equals IR, when we take R to the other side, uh, becomes this for an electrical circuit. Exactly analogously in heat transfer, we can say that the heat flowing through the wall here, Q, is equal to T out minus T in divided by the resistance of the, of the wall, of the insulation. Now this Q is for one small section of the, of the wall. Q, B, and D, which is the Q, the, the, the heat flowing through the entire boundary, is going to be equal to the sum of all of the Qs of all of the sections of the, of the house. So for example, there's a certain amount of heat that flows through the wall. There's a certain amount of heat that flows through the windows. They have much less resistance than your, than your, than your wall does. And we can sum these up in the same exact way that we sum up resistors in parallel for, a, for an electrical circuit. And we can come up with some, some resistance, which we'll call R star, which is a combination of all the resistances of all of the components of the, of the envelope of the house, all of the, the components of the, of the boundary of our control volume. Now, when we're dealing with heat transfer in a house or a structure, we often, we, we will break from the electrical analogy here because we usually don't treat things in terms of, of resistances. We usually treat them in terms of conductances. Since conductance is the reciprocal of resistance, then we can write that QBND is equal to some constant K times T out minus T in. So all these terms you under, uh, uh, you've seen before, except for K, just think of K as a, a large term that lumps all of the bits of the enclosure together and comes up with some, some uh, constant that, that relates the temperature difference to the outside to the heat flowing across the boundary. This is a fairly straightforward equation, but it's as we expect. As, as the resistance of the insulation, for example, goes down, the conductance, K, goes up, and for a given temperature differential, more heat comes across the boundary. As the temperature different, differential between outside and inside goes up, more heat goes across the boundary. Uh, if you recall at the beginning up here, when we wrote um, Q, B, and D on the right-hand side, we see that if the temperature on the outside is greater than the temperature on the inside, that Q, B, and D will be positive, and that means that the energy and the temperature inside will increase. So all of these make physical sense, even if they uh, are the result of a few approximations. By substitution, then, we can write C dt in dt is equal to, substituting for Q, B, and D now, we have K times T out minus T in plus Q sub I. We can rewrite this a little bit here, and we'll write C times the derivative of the indoor temperature with respect to time. We'll take the T in over here to the left-hand side, so we get plus K T in equals K times the outside temperature plus QI. This is a first order ordinary differential equation. It's an ordinary differential equation because it only involves ordinary derivatives, not partial derivatives. It's first order because uh, the derivative of the temperature only appears in the first uh, as, the, as the first derivative. It's linear because all of the all of the T in terms appear by themselves. It actually has constant coefficients because C and K are all constant. It's non-homogeneous because we have these two terms over here on the right which are 
forcing terms, which will keep the temperature from from excuse me from going to to uh, to zero, for example. If you haven't had differential equations, don't sweat it. You you should have had enough physics to by now that you can see where the derivation comes from, and we can we can show that a solution exists without going through all the steps of differential equations to actually solve it. Indeed, if we make a fairly big assumption now that T out, the outside temperature, is constant, this is obviously unrealistic for a house, um, but for evaluation purposes and doing our little experiment, we'll make this assumption so that we can so that we can get at the rest of the at the rest of physics. We'll relax this assumption later. If T out is constant, then the solution to this equation is T in as a function of time is equal to the initial indoor temperature times E to the minus K over C T plus the quantity T out plus Q I over K times 1 minus e to the minus k over c t. Wow, that looks like an awful lot of stuff. If you've had ordinary differential equations, then you should be able to derive the solution after, I don't know, about a page of algebra is what I went through. If you haven't had differential equations, don't sweat it. You can show by substitution that this is indeed a solution to the equation up there. And we can evaluate it physically as well to see that it, that, it, that it makes sense for us. So, for example, when t equals 0, when time equals 0 at the initial point, e to the 0 is 1. Here we have e to the 0 is 1, so we get 1 minus 1 is 0. So the only thing that we're left with is t in at 0. That's great. When, time is at, when we start our experiment, we expect the, the temperature to be the temperature when we start our experiment. Terrific. When t time goes to infinity, then all the exponential terms go to zero, and the initial temperature becomes irrelevant because there's no after a, after a long enough time, it doesn't matter what your initial temperature was. All we see is that we get a zero down here, a one here, and so then the the temperature on the inside, as t goes to infinity is just going to be equal to T out plus QI over K. Or if, for example, we're designing a heating system for our house, we can rearrange this and show that QI is equal to T in minus T out times K. So if we know how leaky our house is or how, how tight our house is, we know what temperature we like to keep the house at. We know what the worst case temperature we can have on the outside is. Then we then we can figure out that we need, to, in order to maintain all of that for, for a long period of time, we need to put in a heater that puts out so many watts so that we can um, keep the house nice and, and toasty warm.